Hey friends out there in YouTube land, Rob Ham here, and today we're going to be talking about this camera, the Fujifilm Instax Mini Evo, specifically the lens, this 28mm f2 lens. We're going to do a little research and see if we can find out some more about the image sensor behind the lens, as well as if the lens really is a 28mm f2 lens. I got a spoiler alert for you. I don't think that it is. In fact, I know that it's not. There's, there's no way it can't be. And today we're gonna prove it. Now, we're gonna be speaking in some generalities because we don't necessarily have specifics, but our little detective search right here will be an interesting journey to go on anyways. This is gonna be kind of a deep dive, so it is what I call a coffee cup kind of conversation, which means it might take a little bit longer than the regular video, and it's going to meander. So if you like that kind of video, grab some snacks, stick around. We're gonna chit chat about it. If not, take a hike. We'll see you later. Guys, I wanna thank you for watching and stopping by. Please like and subscribe to the content. It helps out my channel quite a bit. And if you find any of this fun, exciting, leave your comments below. And don't forget to do the very important thing, which is smash those Amazon links. If you're gonna get some Instax film or a camera, or if you need to get some dishwasher detergent, don't forget to use those links. I'll get a couple pennies from it. Also, we've actually adjusted the exposure a little bit today so that you can kind of see what's on the screen a little bit better. I hope that it works well. My face might be a little dark. Up here closer, things might get blown out because I get closer to the light. In any event, let's jump into it. Oh boy, this has been difficult. So really, we're trying to find a couple of things out about the camera. Number one, we've got to figure out what kind of sensor is being used because we really want to test or check the lens. Is Fujifilm being honest with us about the aperture and the focal length of the lens? I got a hint for you. Um, I don't think that they are, and here's why. This is a Sony full-frame camera. This is the a7R II, and it's got this beautiful uh, 28 millimeter f2 lens on it. Now this lens is designed to create an image circle that literally goes over and complete on this sensor that you can see in there somewhere. Maybe you see it in there. Okay, so that's a big sensor requires a big lens. Now if we compare this lens hold it off to the side, to this lens, do you guys see a difference? I mean, I don't know, I see a little bit of a difference. So something's not right. What we're gonna find out today is that Fujifilm has applied the crop factor to the focal length, but not applied the crop factor to the actual native aperture compared to the focal length of the actual lens. This is important to us because we're photographers, we care about aperture and things like that. This may have a little bit to do with why we don't have any manual controls over this camera. And I had some comments before that where people were saying that maybe the reason that we don't have manual controls over the camera has to do with the sensor uh, being so bad in low light or whatever that it wouldn't be of a help anyways. And this I think makes sense because the, well, because maybe we'll find out that the aperture value of the sensor when equated to full frame in order to compare is so small, it's almost like pinhole photography. And have you looked real closely? at the little hole in the center of this plastic lens right here. If you have, you might have seen that it's really tiny, almost difficult to measure. So we're gonna jump into that now. So first of all, let's talk about that again. I, I, want, to, I want to make apparent to you, this Lego man is holding a camera, okay? The camera itself is now in my hand. The lens cap, the element that actually makes the camera look like a camera, has a lens cap, a little Lego, and that Lego is eight millimeters across. The Lego itself is eight millimeters across. Okay, you could fit three or four of those on your thumbnail almost, okay? This is gonna be important later. Okay, we've talked about that. Now we're gonna move into what do we know about the camera. Well, like we said, we know that we've got 2560 by 1920 over one fifth of an image sensor. That's the size. So I did some digging around. After looking around, I found out pretty simply that we've actually got this OmniCell uh, or OmniVision Pure Cell CMOS sensor, which is 2592 by 1944. It's not exactly the same size, but it gets us close and it tells us some interesting things about the sensor. And this is the one that we're going to go over. Uh, it gives us a sensor size and image area of 2.9 millimeters by 2.2 millimeters. The entire array could fit inside of the cap of this, <laughs> this little cap for this Lego man, right, camera, okay? That tells us how small this actually is. The sensor is tiny. We're gonna use that information in a second to go ahead and do some calculations to find out the crop factor. But before we do, we're gonna jump into one more rabbit hole. I, I wasn't happy with just this not being exactly the same. 
this has the most information, so this is what we're going to use to make our general generalizations about the image sensor on this camera. But I did find one different camera, or one different sensor. When searching, I found the Samsung Isocell S5K5E2, right? And this particular one is a one-fifth image sensor, 5 megapixels, 4.95 megapixels, but it's got the same dimensions. And I saw that it was used over 10 years ago almost in the HTC One M8. Think about that. When we think about the images that come off this camera, specifically the dynamic range, that kind of makes sense. And the reason that I say that makes sense is because the Omnivision is saying that this sensor, this pure cell image sensor is great for imaging, notebooks, and uh, mobile phone sensors, specifically for front-facing cameras. And it's got a lot of specifications, uh, like uh, specifications for um, you know, quad HD video and things like that, specifications that this camera does not need. When looking for the ISO cell by Samsung, I went over here and where do you find it? I couldn't find any information on Samsung's website. It's so old, they even got it out of the archives or at least the archives that I could search. Maybe someone else, maybe internet sleuths out there, you detectives could find out some information, not me. But Alibaba solved the problem, right? No problem, Alibaba's got it. So here, you and I can buy this five pieces at 10 bucks a pop. $50, we can get five of these cameras, throw them on our Raspberry Pi boards and make all kinds of little digital cameras that we'd like. 2,000 more pieces, $4.50. Fujifilm's buying power means that if they were using a sensor similar to this or this sensor, they're getting them for literally pennies on the dollar. Pennies on a, it's a $200 device, okay? But what's important here is it does talk to us a little bit about some of the specifications. Specifically, it talks about an angle of view. Now, angle of view is important because this is an all-in-one package. It actually has a lens already built onto it. It's actually got an F number of F2.4. If they made these in different variants, it could have an F2.0 lens, it could have an F2.0 aperture, which would make sense. These are not articulating apertures, which means they literally are little tiny itty bitty pinholes, right? In a, in a medium, usually a polycarbonate, precisely drilled or precisely lasered or precisely etched with acid pinholes in metal or polycarbonate that will create a perfectly round circle so that you don't get any cat's eyes in the, um, in the image focusing. That aperture needs to be nice and round. That being the case, it doesn't tell us exactly how small the sensor is. It doesn't give us any dimensions. So we come back over here to the uh, Omnivision Pure Cell. And by looking at the Omnivision Pure Cell and using 29.28 uh, by 22.05 or 2.928 by 2.205 millimeters, we can use that and Pythagorean's theorem to go ahead and tell us just what the actual diagonal length is of the image sensor. Now, going through all that, let's talk about how we come to crop factor. So we want to compare apples to apples here. So what we need to do is we need to find what the diagonal length of the rectangular sensor is for full frame. That's what we're comparing to. We then need to find the diagonal length of the sensor that we are uh, using in here. And then we need to take the diagonal length of the full frame sensor and divide by the diagonal length of the other sensor. And we will find how many times smaller that sensor is. That's what we're going to do. In order to do that, we're going to use some math. Pythagorean's theorem It's pretty great. Now, even I had to refresh myself on crop factor after a long time. And it's interesting to know one fifth of an inch sensor is difficult to find any kind of information on. In fact, if you just go look up crop factors, you'll have a hard time on Google just finding information lower than one over three. So one over five. So we go up to crop factor. If you go over here, I'm going to say this to photography life. This is great. It's the number one uh, pop, uh, at link that pops up. If you check on that, you'll actually read everything that you want. But the part that we want down here is the one that talks about how to determine crop factor. So they've actually already done it for us. For full frame like this, we already know what we need to know. 30, we use Pythagorean's theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, and then we take the square root of that result, right? So 36 squared plus 24 squared is 1872. So we take the square root of 1872, which is 43 points some change, and we have that, that's our base. So we do the same thing over here, okay? We're gonna go ahead and come back over here to our um, isocell, not isocell, to our uh, pure cell, and we're just gonna look right here. And we're gonna take what we know, 2.9 squared plus 2.2 squared equals 13.25. Okay, so now we're gonna take the square root of 13.25.
which is 3.46. Okay, great. Now, what we're going to do for that 3.46 is we're going to take 43.2 and divide it by 3.4. And we get, and remember, we were rounding, and we get a, um, a crop factor. We get a result of 12.7, okay? Well, this is very important because that's going to tell us that this is about 12 times smaller, right, than full frame. The image sensor here is telling us it's about 12 times, 12 times smaller than full frame. Okay. Well, let's find out if that makes any sense. The aperture on here is, or the focal length on here, they say is 28, right? So let's just take 28, okay. Uh, and divide it by 12, 2.3. So that means that our focal length is 2.3 millimeters. Let's find out if we've got something that talks about focal length, EFL, effective focal length, okay? Now I don't see it right here, but I've downloaded, I can download the actual tech specs in just a second, but let's find on the ISO cell, what does Alibaba say? F number 2.5, effective focal length, 1.98. That's pretty close. Let's see if there's another one on one of these other ones down here. There you go. Effective focal length. Okay, now we've got a little bit of rounding to consider. So if our effective focal length is 1.98 here on this ISO cell by Samsung, and if we weren't rounding, I think we're in the rounding error of 2.3, 2.2 to be close enough to say, hey, that's where you get your effective focal length. So the reality is if this was it, 1.98 times 12, or, or, or whatever, if our, wrong, if our math was wrong, we're pretty close, which means that 12 point something as a crop factor, what does that mean to the aperture? Well, 12 times two is 24. That means that this is really a 24, an F24 lens. Well, that might answer some questions as to why Fujifilm chose to go with a camera that can go up to 1600 ISO and as fast as one eight thousandth of a second uh, and down to a quarter uh, because that would allow you the range to actually photograph in the bright sunlight as well as photograph um, in moderately dark conditions but because of that aperture being around a real aperture instead of f2 more like 24 I would take some pretty rough pictures indoors or at nighttime, and that's exactly what we see. We don't have enough leeway in the shutter speed to make up for that. Now, all of this is just completely pure speculation. What does it really mean for the camera? Well, nothing, actually. It, the camera still works whether or not we talk about these for, for what they're worth or not. But what it does tell us is how would Fujifilm improve this camera on the next generation? And they've got some technological things to overcome if they're going to do that. Specifically, if they wanted to make a more manual version of this, the biggest lens that we could get would be something like this. It's something that they already have. And that tells us that if they did that, what exactly would that look like? Let me go back to this page so you can see. Well, we've got the two cameras here, and if we hold them side by side like that, you could kind of see, right, that that's what the camera would kind of look like. It would become a little bit thicker, right? But to get a, a larger aperture, to get something in the range of the Mint camera's 5.6 wide aperture would be almost impossible on this, specifically with a digital sensor. Um, to get something that large with an analog system uh, would be possible, but then it would be something that would be as chunky as this. So when we look at what Fujifilm's actually done, their engineering is, is pretty good. They could give us a larger sensor. The larger sensor would make the camera thicker, it would make the lens a little bit bigger, but it wouldn't really give us any additional bokeh on a camera of this size. In order to get any bokeh or additional features, we'd have to go to a camera that really requires the lens to open up. Now, this lens would not work on a digital sensor, well, because it's made to focus light over <laughs> a full area of film, which is the Instax Mini. So that wouldn't work. They can't just slap one of those on these. But what they could do is make a completely analog version of this camera in this camera. No more digital. Problem is there, you get rid of quite a few um, uh, updates with, with regard to the sensor. So what could they do? 
I think the number one thing they could do with this camera is twofold. In the future update, maybe threefold. In the future update, build the camera better. It's not a very good build quality. Um, and the non-rechargeable or non-removable battery means that you just can't use it ever again once the battery dies. What, are you going to send a $200 camera to Fujifilm to replace a battery? Nah, I just don't see that happening. Okay? Um, so they should think about how they're going to build it. If they think about the longevity of this camera, then they could get the price point up there to Mint's price point, $800, $900, and people would buy this all day long. They need to give a better sensor. They need to give a better flash. In fact, if they want to continue with LED flash, I'm totally cool with that. Allow it to be user controllable so that you can control the amount of flash that you need in this situation, even if they're not going to put a Xenon flash. And then give us a slightly larger sensor, maybe a one-fifth would go to a one half inch sensor, or even a one third or a one over 2.5 inch sensor, but a bigger sensor with additional capabilities specifically for dynamic range. Now, this sensor is quite likely, I think we saw on here 10 bit, right? Um, somewhere around here I saw it's a 10 bit sensor, um, which is good. Eight bit JPEGs are 16.8 million colors. 10 bit, uh, well, a 10 bit sensor is 1.07. 12 bit gets into so many billions of colors. We would like a larger bitrate sensor because if you had a better sensor, even in a small form factor, we would then have some archiving capability for the JPEGs that come out of here. Even if the JPEGs were still just JPEGs, as long as they were a higher resolution, higher quality JPEG, not so compressed, this would actually make a great time capsule camera where you toss in a memory card, print and you know, take pictures until the camera's no good anymore, and then you've got the memory card with all of the images on it. So there we go. Those are the three things that I think they could do. Update the build quality, update the sensor size, and then think about the camera as far as being a long-term uh, use type of camera. That's just my two cents. This has been a long conversation. I hope that you have enjoyed. It's been a rabbit hole we've gone down. If you like this video, don't forget to like and subscribe. Hit those Amazon links down below. I want to thank you for watching. Before I go, let me just ask you, please leave your comments down below. I'd really like to hear what you have to think. Bye for now.